Well, welcome to Good for a Chat. Again, this is now, I think, the fourth month that we've uh, met up with a community change maker or a person doing good in their hoods or other people's hoods. Uh, and this really is a place where we can meet someone who's making change in Australian communities. Uh, we love finding out what drives them, what moves them, what makes them excited and why the hell they do what they do. <laughs> because it's tough work, it's hard work. And we know from our experience that it can be sometimes thankless work as well. So um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Wollamadigal today. I'm on the edge of the Eora and Darug Nations. Uh, I'm on the land of the Snapperfish people. And I'd like to pay my respects to, to them and to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island our elders past, present and emerging and also acknowledge that we're all on different countries today and um, if you'd like to let us know where you're coming into from today um, we'd love to learn a bit more about your country as well. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and that we must recognise the importance of the oldest living communities um, and country if we're able to improve the planet and the world that we live in now. Um, we have today our first Tasmanian guest, which is exciting, and our first town planner as well, which is also exciting. Uh, so today we're speaking with the wonderful Dean Cracknell, who's co-founder and one of the leaders at the Town Team Movement. And Dean's all about enabling locally, local communities and local governments to connect, organise and regenerate their communities in new and interesting ways to create great places which make people want to be there and go there. <laughs> um, and the Town Team Movement, uh, which we'll learn a little more about, is a, a social enterprise, it's a not-for-profit that builds a movement of people who do good things. <laughs> so um, we are really lucky to have Dean, he's a busy guy, he's going to tell us a bit about the work he's been doing even today, uh, race back uh, this morning from Hobart. So um, he's uh, one of a hundred global placemaking ex-people. He's a self-confessed driver, dreamer and communicator and we are really lucky to have him with us today. Please welcome Dean Cracknell. Hi Joe, thanks very much for that intro. It's all right mate, I, hopefully I didn't say anything incorrect. <laughs> or something you can't live um, up to. I'm sure you can. <laughs> Welcome. Make it till you make it. <laughs> that's right, mate. That's right. Welcome. Um, how cold is it in Tasmania today? That is the first question, of course. It's not too bad here in Launceston. There's a bit of a north-south rivalry, as you might know, in Tasmania. So it was pouring rain and freezing cold in Hobart. But it's blue skies in Launceston with a couple of clouds. So uh, Beautiful. Be Beautiful. Fantastic. And now you've not been in Tasmania a long time. This is a fairly recent move for you. Is that right? Yeah, it's been a very long term plan for my wife and I to get here, uh, probably about 10 or 15 years at least. So uh, we moved over in February last year, very thankfully, um, just before um, COVID really kicked off. And um, it was sort of a fulfillment of um, a long time dream to be living in Tassie. So we're really happy to be here. And Met some wonderful people already, so um, really enjoying being in Tassie. Wonderful. Now, you're a town planner, and, you know, I don't know how much people know about town planners and, and what they do, um, but what drove you to explore that kind of work when you were, you know, looking at something to study? Um, I've always been interested in um, sociology and geography and humanities, really, so you know, what, um, what happens to, to places and people. So um, I kind of uh, made a decision earlier on um, after university that I never really wanted a career. Uh, but then when I hit 30, I thought, oh, hang on, I might need something. Um, so fortunately, um, I went back and did a master's of urban and regional planning. And I remember on my first day just being uh, excited and really feeling like I found a niche. Um, and I really, really enjoyed the planning and it gave me a, a very good background um, into, I guess, policy and legislation, but also how the mechanics and machinery of government works, or maybe doesn't work sometimes. Um, 
So I did that for 12 years and, and worked in a couple of local governments in Perth in Western Australia. So really did that and it's um, been you know, invaluable background for the work that um, I'm doing now. And so when you're experienced in local government, what, what did you learn about planning and, and placemaking and how much of what the community thinks and feels guides processes? Well, planning um, is inherently sort of top down. So it's, um, you know, intended to, uh, to be looking into the future and then putting in place strategies and plans um, which then are backed up by um, town planning schemes and policies to sort of implement that plan. Um, so I remember when I was um, first at Planner, I mean, that all seemed fairly, um, fairly sensible. But um, I guess the longer you spend in local government and then doing volunteer work in the community, you realise that there's another, there's another approach, um, the bottom-up approach and what the local people know and think and want to do in their own local area. Um, and planning can do lots of things, but it's not very adaptive and responsive, particularly to um, quick moving crises or uh, new things happening. So it takes a very long time to change a planning system. So the, the top down and the bottom up need to be much better at working together and basically value adding to, to, each, um, to each approach rather than just doing one approach or the other approach. And, or them not talking to each other and not um, enhancing um, each other. So I sort of realized um, after a few years in local government that the top-down stuff is important and the work that government do, and you know, we're very lucky in Australia, we've got a very good government sector um, in comparison to many countries around the world, but the top-down and the government-led approach needs to be working with the community and the bottom-up approach. Mm -hmm. And I guess you've seen how hard it is at times for governments to perhaps engage communities as well, as much as communities probably feel it's hard to, you know, connect with governments. So is, is that how you started uh, thinking that there might be another way to look at planning or connecting communities? And, and, and how did you get started with Town Teams Movement? Yeah, so while I was working in local government, um, I got involved with a local group in my um, local area in Perth and um, they were doing some really good things already um, and had um, done two years of a major street festival. Um, so I thought, well, if I'm going to get involved in my community, that would be a really good group to, to get involved with. And over a period of time, that sort of became the first prototype town team. Um, and whilst I was sort of doing that community work, um, a lot of other um, places and, and suburbs close by and sometimes far away were also interested in this group and what they were doing and how this happened and how do you start and so I was going out and doing a lot of the work that I'm doing now just as a volunteer um, to help those groups and um, the, the amazing thing was that there's so many passionate people out there wanting to contribute but they just need a little bit of help and guidance and sometimes just some moral support um, so uh, that sort of put a, a seed of an idea in my brain. And then some other people um, in Perth as well had the same um, approach or experiences. So we, we got together and thought, well, there's something in this and there's a real need to help these positive groups, uh, to connect them up and to, I guess, make sure that all the knowledge and experiences that people have isn't lost or just kept in that one group that we can spread it across groups and across cities and across states rather than everyone having to start from scratch so that's really what town team movement's about is to share the knowledge um, the resources the templates the stories the inspiration to as many people as we can um, and the town team volunteers are really the heroes so we um, had a long think about what we wanted to do and how we could best help and um, Jimmy uh, my colleague came up with this brilliant approach um, as he was in the shower one morning of instead of being an overarching peak body that tells people what to do we're an underarching support mechanism so supporting from underneath rather than from the top so really sort of elevating the town teams and the volunteers to be the, um, the front end and hero of our of our movement um, and like you know Joe many people want to give back and they also want to be part of something bigger so by being part of a movement, 
you're not just um, working away in your own local place. You're part of this movement, which includes town teams, but includes many, many other organisations and movements and people who want to do good things. And that's, um, that's a really important need that people have, that they want to be feeling like they're doing some good and contributing, but also part of something bigger. Well, you can use this one for free, Dean, but would it be fair to say that you're the underwire bra of the community-led placemaking movement? Just just putting it out there, you know. I hadn't thought of it like that, Joe. No, it's very, fem- it's very female kind of driven analogy, but I'll just leave it with you for you and Jimmy. To- I'll go with it. Yeah, yeah, excellent. That's great. <laughs> the girdle. Um, anyway, I'll stop. Uh, so... What is it that town teams do then? So you, is it an organic process? Talk us about if someone decides that they're going to embark on this journey, what does it look like uh, between them and you? Yeah, so anyone can be part of a town team. So obviously the, the word team implies that there's multiple people involved. So it's a bit hard to be a town team by yourself. But assuming that there's a number of people, whether they're businesses, residents, visitors, students, Um, who get together and want to improve their own local area, the only thing we ask is that they sign up to a Charter of Behaviour. So the the Charter of Behaviour is really sort of the bedrock of the movement and it's the glue that connects all the teams up. Uh, And the the Charter principles are fairly straightforward, but positive, proactive, apolitical and action-focused are the main ones. And they sound fairly common sense, but... Um, they actually provide a really good guidance mechanism and our purpose for a group. Um, So that's really the the one thing that um, unites the movement and and unites all the teams. But apart from that, all the teams do quite different things. So um, some groups are more focused on a town centre and might be more focused on small business or bringing people to the area or events or activations or murals. Uh, And town centres are such wonderful um, environments too because anyone can go to a town centre and um, it's a place that's been um, used for thousands of years for exchange and um, it's a place where people mix. So it's a bit different to a shopping centre where not everyone is welcome and particularly when the shopping centre is closed, you obviously can't use the place, but a town centre is a place that um, anyone can use anytime. So that's one um, big focus. Uh, But if you're in a regional town, a town team might be a um, a model to connect up all those groups. So if you're in a town of 400, 500 people, there's only so many volunteers around. But how do you get the tennis club and the the football club and um, the Progress Association and others all working together? So a town team can provide sort of a neutral um, avenue, if you like, for that. So sometimes they might be coordinating existing groups. Sometimes they might be environmentally focused. They might be wanting to plant trees or improve the area um, that way. Or it might be more about social connections and events and getting to know your neighbours. So really we don't, um, we say that there's anything you can do um, is good. So just do what interests you and what gives you energy and um, fuels your passion. Uh, and the only thing we ask is that you um, align with that charter of behaviour and um, we don't charge any fees or forms or anything like that. So it's a, um, it's a loose movement rather than, um, you know, needing to fill in forms and pay membership fees and all that sort of thing. We're really sort of um, trying to do the best we can to help those groups do what they want to do in their own local area. And is it... Dean, do you see that um, existing groups who've been around for a while are quite open to new structures and new ways of um, working together? Or is there sometimes a little bit of resistance because it's not how we've done things before? Um, A bit of both, Joe. So sometimes, um, you know, uh, people in groups just get really excited and go, well, if we've been doing this for 30 years, why would we not be part of this movement? and sometimes people say that's not for us and that's fine too. We, we don't sort of aim to um, like have a certain number of teams or be massive or anything like that. We're just um, helping the people who want to be part of the movement and um, helping out other groups if and when we can. Uh, but one of the things you might have come across uh, and it's very common in our experience is the way groups used to organise mm-hmm. is not always the way that people want to organise now. Um, 
So not too many younger people under 30 would want to be a treasurer of an association or a um, president or a, a secretary. And, and those are still important roles and you know, sometimes legislated roles, but there's other ways of organising a group as well. So we got some legal advice and um, have a, a different model of how a group can organise and still fulfil all the, the legal requirements, but allow everyone to be able to participate and lead in that group rather than just a few people leading and having all the obligations on those leaders. So they're important sort of things, even if um, a group decides that's not for them, but at least we provide an alternative for them. Fantastic. And I um, I feel like when we talk about team, town teams, I really probably need to have some slides of photos because I feel like the pictures of what the teams do are so much more um explanatory than anything that you could possibly tell us but so I would encourage people to go and check out your website um, because it really does paint a picture of the diversity of things that people do and when you're talking about action and doing it really mm. is quite a broad thing can you share some of the things that you've seen in the projects that the teams have brought together and you have quite a lot of teams too is that right yeah we're now up to 68 teams um, and um, we, our major partner in Western Australia, RAC, um, is a fabulous partner for us because they're helping our organisation with some funding, but particularly giving grant funding to town teams. So at the bigger end um, of the scale, some town teams run um, regular Monday night markets or events. Um, some um, teams um, actually physically um, do up a space. So they invest either grant funding or their own funding in placemaking projects to um, you know, beautify an area or add seats or trees or murals, um, those sort of things. So um, they're at sort of at the bigger end of the scale. And at the smaller end of the scale, it might be just a neighborhood catch up or it might be just regular Wednesday night drinks at the pub um, for whoever wants to come and meet some neighbors. So. The, um, I think the best ideas are when they're free or very cheap and easy to do. Uh, and it's very easy to spend a lot of time um, feeling obliged to do things. So we really um, encourage people to do what's fun uh, and do what gives you energy because it can be hard work. And if you're just feeling like you're giving all the time and not receiving anything, that burns people out and burnout's probably the you know, the biggest risk in, in being a community change maker and environmental activist. If you burn out, then you can burn really brightly for a little while, but you can't continue the, the progress. So if we can find things that people really enjoy doing and hopefully a bit easier, it's more likely to happen over a longer period of time and we create bigger impact with, uh, mm. with that longer impact. I just had someone message a question direct to me. Uh, it says, what has been, uh, how have town teams been impacted by COVID? Have they stopped altogether or have they been able to find other ways to interact? Uh, great question. So, yes, it has had an impact, particularly on events. So um, teams often find that an event, whether it's big or small, is a good way to bring people together. So obviously um, those sort of things were impacted and in um, you know in places like Melbourne are still being impacted now um, but one of the uh, really clever ways that I've heard um, was an idea called Porch Placemaking Week which was on um, last year um, I think Yan Ling you'll remember that um, a, uh, an, a group of people um, from around the world organized Porch Placemaking Week and just encouraged people to do something out in front of their home or in their front porch or in the front yard um, to bring life and activity to the streets. So that was a fantastic decentralised approach that went around the world. And I can't remember how many countries, but it might have been 25 or 30 countries. So um, our town teams were part of that. So it might really be just bringing the kids to play in the front yard or out onto the footpath rather than them playing around the back. Uh, and an iteration of that um, in Fremantle in Western Australia was um, an idea called a porch fest where instead of having an event in a venue or a pub, the performers actually played on a front porch or a front veranda of people's homes and people could stand in the street and watch um, a musical performance or a, a theatre performance. So it was free, um, people could just come and go as they liked and 
it was a way of, of still bringing people together and bringing joy and activity, but um, uh, you know, adhering with COVID requirements as well. But it certainly has had an impact, but it certainly hasn't stopped the teams doing um, wonderful things. Fantastic. Um, we had another question about um, uh, how town teams have sustained the interest of members within it and who are the best people to have in town teams? Well, I'll start with the second question. I mean, anyone is anyone who wants to get involved are the best people. So they choose themselves. Uh, and it's good to have a diversity of people. And you, our model is very inclusive because it's not about business, it's not about residents, it's not about a particular sector or interest. It's about a place. And places have any, you know, many people live in a place. And often there's not many ways for those people to meet apart from bumping into each other on the street or in a park where there's sort of no organised way for those people to meet. So this is a t intentionally a place-based group that's about a particular street or suburb rather than a sector-based or an interest-based group. So the best people are the ones who want to get involved and, and turn up and, and be part of it. Uh, and sustaining interest is, is not always easy. That's uh, along with burnout. How do you motivate volunteers and, and get people interested? Um, we'd probably advise just focus. You don't, you're never going to have everyone in a suburb involved in a town team. So just focus on the people who want to be involved and do what um, gives them energy and, and what they want to do rather than forcing projects on people um, and keep them small and hopefully simple if possible. Um, that also means that um, people are more interested or able to tap in when they've got time and energy to do it rather than a major street festival, I can tell you from experience, it takes a lot of work and you feel pretty exhausted at the end of it, even though it's a fantastic thing to do. Uh, and probably the last point is that um, it, it, it's hard for governments to have a relationship with their individuals um, because individuals come and go and get busy or move to another place. But the government can have a much better relationship with the town team and the individual people in the, in the government, um, mainly talking about local government, but in the local government and in the town team can come and go. But the local government and the town team can develop a relationship and trust over time. So it's a way of building relationships um, with other organisations and with local governments, which placemaking probably hasn't really done that well in the past. Often it's um, government to individuals or a group of individuals, whereas this is um, local government having a relationship with the town team, even if the town team individuals or the town team leaders change over a number of years. Mm -hmm. Dean, I asked the question because it's obviously what Good for the Hood focuses on, but how um, or have any of your town teams looked at issues to do with uh, sustainability, waste, emissions reduction? I obviously mentioned some tree planting and some other things, and I know there's been some swap meets and various things, but mm. what sort of environmental um, events or, or programs do they get involved in? Yeah, so some that come to mind, and there's probably lots that I don't know about, so I can only tell you the ones that I can sort of remember, but um, probably the uh, most exciting one was an urban forest strategy that was prepared by the Big Park Collective um, town team in um, uh, Perth, um, so just, just east of the, the city centre, and urban greening um, and trees and um, climate change mitigation adaptation was a really important focus for them. Uh, and the council also knew that it was a focus, but they didn't have a lot of money. So rather than getting a high-priced consultant to do the work, um, the local government actually worked with the town team and local people and other local groups to develop their own urban forest strategy, uh, which was a really innovative approach and meant that the, there was a far more engagement and buy-in from the community because it really was their strategy. Mm -hmm. um, and it sort of provided direction and guidance from the council, but rather than the council saying this is our direction, it was the community saying this is our direction and then working together on how that could be implemented. So that was a really exciting one. And uh, when the word spread of that, um, that, that's sort of one of the first examples in the world that we know of, of an urban forest strategy being prepared by a community group. Um, and was, you know, even in Portuguese, in Brazil, they were going, wow, this is amazing. 
that um, a community can step up and do those sort of things. Um, so that's one example. Um, as you mentioned, quite a few swap meets and buy nothing days and those sort of things, which is really good and important. Um, Revegetation and planting of particular areas, um, uh, fixing up new parks with um, native plants, those sort of things. So um, yeah, there's some of the ones that come to mind on the environmental focus. And we'd love to see more groups having an environmental focus as well. So Great. more the better. I have a question also about control um, because you've just talked about a really amazing example of communities being trusted to take a fairly, I imagine, complex task on, on board. How, what sort of relinquishment of control or what sort of trust does that involve from an organisation to give that to community? And I know you know, having worked within councils and with councils, and it, it that would be quite a step for many um, and a risk. <laughs> how do you navigate that or how has that been navigated? Yeah, so I think um, it's about relationships fundamentally. So you're not going to get that happening in the first year of operation of a town team. You need to build up trust and confidence on both sides. Because if a local government doesn't have trust that a town team is capable or um, experienced enough to do it, then I think you know you wouldn't want to just jump in and do it, um, putting your local government hat on. But equally, if you've developed um, trust and, and relationships with that team over a number of years and you know that they're capable or at least worth giving a shot, then um, why would you not do it? Because you. You sometimes you engage a consultant for the cheapest price or you, you engage a consultant and you do your due diligence, but essentially you're trusting a third party to do work as well. So, um, you know, local governments have a pretty tough job. I, you know, I very strong passion for local government as well. Um, but, if, you know, without trust and without confidence, uh, it, we're not going to make it as a species. So I think we need to be a little bit brave and, and give people um, the ability and enable them to do the work, but you can't expect that to happen straight away too. The, the, the town team needs to earn the trust and earn the confidence. Uh, you were talking about that you've just been involved in um, a project in Tasmania. Um, so I'd love you to just tell us a little bit about that, um, but also What's next for town teams? Have you got something big happening and coming up? And um, after that, how can we get involved? How, you know, I know that you're not in every state at the moment, but if you've got someone who's sitting there going, me, 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 what can we do to get involved? Um, well, the, the exciting project we're doing in Hobart, and um, I'd love to hear from other people, um, you know, either in the chat box or let me know otherwise, but uh, there's 15 community-led projects that have been funded by the Glenorchy City Council, and it's a placemaking program called Showcase Moona. So it's the first time I've heard 15 community projects all happening in one place at about the same time. So it started in May, and the, um, the last project was actually completed yesterday. So... One of um, the examples was um, pop-up um, guerrilla gardening. And um, it was really sort of trying to show that greening a space and putting in seats and making it a good um, people habitat is um, not that difficult. But very innovatively, they moved this um, little garden set up around to about 10 spots in this town centre. And they've taken photos <clears throat> and they've pasted that up on walls to show people, well, that was just a very quick temporary pop-up, but this is what happened and this would be the improvement if we did this more permanent. So that's um, one example. We had uh, major street markets. <clears throat> so let's get some water. I'm just sharing your website now for anyone who hasn't already been on there and excited. Um, it's obviously townteammovement.com. So please go and check it out and, and pour over the gorgeous photos and stories on there and the case studies because it's, it's pretty inspiring stuff. Dean's back. Thanks, Joe. Bit of a dry throat. <clears throat> um, yeah, so that was one example. We had major street markets where there was 4,000 people turn up on a day. Um, yesterday, we had um, 
for Tasmanian Symphony Orchestra performers playing on the post office steps and playing some fuse from um, Bach and telling people about what this music meant and why it was so important to the history of music and um, doing that with um, flannelette tails on. They're actually wearing flannelette with uh, modified tails at the back. and. Very that Tasmanian, sort of really very Tasmanian. I like it. It's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so this was really trying to blend high culture and um, not so high culture uh, together. But um, <clears throat> I think when you tap into the passion of local people, they come up with some such creative ideas. So, yeah, so 15 community projects, all um, a Rory except, uh, success except for one. <clears throat> so that was really exciting. Fantastic. And okay, so sorry, what's your second next? question? Yes, yeah, second question. What's next and how can we get involved? Um, well, I think getting involved means um, working on what you might want to do to improve your own local area. So um, it might be joining an existing group. If there's not an existing group that interests you, maybe you want to start a town team. So uh, if you've got multiple people together and you want to start a town team in your own area, um, you just jump on our website and have a look um, at the town teams page and that gives you a bit of a background on what a town team is and um, the town team charter. And if you're on, on board with that charter of behaviour, which is about being positive, proactive, action focused and apolitical, then all you need to do is email us and say, we've just formed a new town team uh, and this is our name and can we be part of the movement? And we go, yeah, wonderful, yes, you can. So it's as simple as that. So we can have it done in five minutes if you want. Um, or you can just go and, and you know, uh, do Good for the Hood or Transition Towns or other groups as well. So we we just sort of give you one option. We're not saying this is the best or the only, but uh, just work out what you want to do and what gives you energy, I think would be my main tip. You know, um, there's plenty of um, need out there but just focus on what gives you energy and what would interest you or what you would want to learn. And then that's a good way to start and you can build up from there. So, yeah, it can be done this weekend, I think, Joe. Lock it in. Yes, done. I'm in. <laughs> um, we just had a question more on a personal level for you, Dean. How do you manage your typical work day? You must have a lot of people, um, you know, and being involved and, you know, this, uh, Yanling's just said, you know, she has so many people just in one precinct. How do you manage, you know, 68 town teams and all of the questions and help that they need? Well, the good thing is we don't manage anyone. Um, we just help and respond uh, to them. So we leave them to it. Um, so we don't have to help everyone all the time. But to be honest, my um, day is, can be a little bit chaotic. It's uh, going from everything from an accounting to strategic planning to helping town teams to fixing websites to going to meetings. So every day is an adventure. Um, so I don't necessarily have a typical day handling. It's, it's always a bit different, but um, I think uh, I, I really like that. I, I wouldn't be very good in an accounting practice. I'm um, doing tax returns all year, every day. Um, so I enjoy doing different things. And I, probably a little bit distracted if I was doing one thing for more than one day. So it's always very different. Fantastic. I can definitely relate to that. <laughs> um, that's amazing. Dean, look, we feel really, really grateful to have tapped into your world uh, for a little while today and certainly to understand a bit more. If anyone's got any more questions before we wrap up, now is your chance. Um, some people will be watching this on replay and if they'd like to know more about town teams, they can go to the townteammovement.com website. Um, you can join a town team or register your interest there. Uh, you can, you know, obviously connect with other people, even if you may be not starting yet, but you want to learn more about how they've done it. And there's some pretty inspiring ideas. I, I actually just love pouring through the photos and stories and seeing people's passion for their local area. Um, and I guess the beautiful thing, which you probably see every day, Dean, is how different the work of a town team can be community to community, suburb to suburb. It really is a reflection of the people and the, the place that you're, uh, you know, creating for. So I guess that's the whole idea, right? 
So, um, but and that's you. why the charter is so important, like because because every place is so different, and we intentionally want that to happen. There needs to be some way to bring everyone together, so some shared values. So that's why the charter is so important for us. Wonderful. Well, look, thank you, Dean. Um, we're really grateful. We we watch with admiration. We're a big fans of Town Team Movement, and we hope to one day bring the hoods and the teams together little less West Side Story, a little more kind of, <laughs> I don't know, whatever it could be, maybe a big, big festival together or something. But uh, we love we love what you do and we love that you're putting the creativity and trust in community. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, so, yeah, thank you. And thanks for sharing a little piece of your crazy day with us. Um, and thank you for those of you who tuned in. It's, it's great to have you. Next month, we're speaking with the wonderful Ronnie Khan from Oz Harvest. So if you haven't yet grabbed a spot to have a chat and ask questions direct to the source, just like we have with Dean, um, grab your ticket today. And thank you again, Dean. We're really grateful to see you and um, we look forward to seeing what's next for you. No problem, Joe. Thank you. Thanks, guys.